Well, everybody knows the name Xerox, and Xerox has a big research center down in Palo Alto called the Palo Alto Research Center, or PARC. Well, Canada has its own version of it, the XRCC, the Xerox Research Center of Canada. And I'm here talking to Dr. Paul Smith about what you do here. You have something to show us today. Yes, today I'm going to talk about a, top, a project that we do at the Xerox Research Center of Canada called Printed Electronics. Printed Electronics. So not not fab, not put together in a gigantic facility, but actually with a printer. That's right. Yeah, most people really associate electronics with silicon and big expensive fab plants, billion dollar fab plants. Whereas really now what we're looking at doing is actually printing all of those electronic components using inks and yes, an inkjet printer. So somebody at home theoretically could print out a new TV? <laughs> Perhaps not quite that far, but it's a special printer similar to your home printer, but this one prints really electronic inks that give the components the electronic characteristics that you need to actually create a backplane for a monitor or a laptop or your PDA. Okay, so obviously you mentioned the, the fabs and people have put millions and millions of dollars into these things and they're quick, they're cheap at doing electronics. Why would we want to start printing them instead? Yeah, you're right. The silicon fabs are fantastic for what they do. The electronics are very high speed and do the functions that they're really made to do. You relate it to really the Pentium chip that's in your laptop. It's very fast. We're not really looking at replacing that. We're really looking at taking electronics to where silicon can't actually reach. Um, when you look in the fabs, basically all of the electronics is made on silicon wafers that look like this. Then you can see that they're very brittle, they're limited in size. So if you really wanted to make a screen or a, a laptop screen that was very, very big or a television for your room that was very, very big, you really have to stitch all of these silicon um, plates all together. That becomes more and more expensive. The, larger it goes and also the these are you can see they're quite brittle mm -hmm. and so it becomes more and more difficult to handle something like that so if ideally if you could print this on something flexible basically from one roll to another you could have something as large as you liked you could have an electronic device as large as you liked that would be very lightweight flexible and um, very robust, which would not, it's not really like a silicon backplane. All right, so what, what do we have to do now to get it off of this silicon onto uh, a flexible uh, printable surface? Okay, the, the real um, aim is to have all of the electronic components that you need to make a transistor, which is really what um, makes the pixel on your screen go on and off. Mm -hmm. um, you need to have them in an ink type form. So you'll need the semiconductor in an ink, a conductor in an ink and a dielectric in an ink and then you basically print all those layers down to finally form the electronic unit, the, the thin film transistor. So really the challenge is to actually get the same kind of um, electronic characteristics from those components in the ink that you would do from a silicon based electronic device. So what, uh, what kind of ink do you have to have to make this work, electronically speaking? Is it a special kind of organic material? Is it a special metal? Yes, so for the semiconductor, we created a um, semiconductor that's made from a polymeric material, and it's a polymer, basically like a plastic, that you print in an ink, but when it actually um, hits the substrate, hits down onto the plastic um, surface, it aligns itself like DNA would align itself and form the double helix. This really likes being next to one another. The chains like aligning themselves together and it forms something that will give it semiconducting properties. Then for the conductor, where you normally have to evaporate silver and melt it at a very high temperature, about 1,000 degrees C. Which won't work so good with plastic. Yeah, obviously. that would that wouldn't help the substrate. Yeah, so you really need something that would melt at about um, 150 degrees C or less. That's very difficult. Mm -hmm. So we end up making an ink from silver particles that you can actually melt at 150 degrees C and form a fully conductive line with the same conductivity as evaporated silver. Yeah, have you worked with any other materials or just silver at this point? Um, we also have a gold um, uh, ink, but obviously that would make the device a lot more expensive and people really prefer to use silver in their backplanes of their displays. 
All right. Well, unless, of course, uh, you want to become a really high-end cable company. Hint, hint. <laughs> Anyways. OK, so let's, let's uh, take a look at the, the process here. So we've got this together now. We've printed this thing. And then what do we do next to make this a uh, fully functional display? OK, so um, to start off with, you can test it. You can have it on a, this is a solid um, glass substrate. So you basically print each layer separately. You print down um, a dielectric layer, then you print the semiconductor, and then you print the conductors, and then that forms a pattern on here, which is a, a TFT. So then you can actually see that this would go behind the display part of your monitor or your PDA. Right. You okay, can, obviously this is not flexible yet. No, this is not flexible, and so that's really where you want to take it, because you can do that kind of electronics using your fab plant. Mm -hmm. This, though, suddenly becomes a flexible display. So here we've printed it on just a, a piece of flexible substrate, but exactly the same. We printed down the metal again, and as I mentioned before, you, you melt that at about 150 degrees C to form the conductive lines, and you print the semiconductor down as well. All right. So now what would the use be for this flexible material other than just the sheer, gee, I can bend my display uh, uh, aspect of it? I think um, really you're looking at flexibility as one aspect that you could have from it. In theory, you could have a rollout display. People talk about that. Um, or you could have something that was very lightweight. All of a sudden, the weight of the silicon is removed, and you have something that's very lightweight. Right. It's also less brittle. So if you dropped your PDA, suddenly perhaps the back plane doesn't break and the display stays intact. Mm -hmm. And you can use it for all different applications. For instance, in specialty packaging, you could have little sensors, because it's very, going to be very cheap to make. So you could have sensors or little memory chips, and eventually, perhaps, uh, rollout displays. There we go. So it's not necessarily about uh, the bigger TV that you can roll up when you're done with it. It's also about more robustness. Yes, well. yes, that's right. And applications that silicon would be too expensive for right now to make kind of disposable um, sensors, that's, that's out of the league of silicon. And really, you could replace that with the plastic, this plastic sensor. There you go. Well, that's uh, printable electronics right out of your inkjet printer. The future is here today.